for this series is so important that we must take our time because people really don't understand marriage itself. So what we're going to try to explain through this series is what marriage is, what divorce is, and what remarriage is. Now, where do we get this series from? Remember, we received this series from Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. It's still in the main series of uh, the Jesus, uh, the ministry of Jesus Christ. We are in season two in this particular overall series. But Jesus is still preaching from the Sermon on the Mount. And we're still in chapter five. And you know, the Sermon on the Mount covers three chapters, chapter five, chapter six, and chapter seven of the book of Matthew. We've already went over the Beatitudes. We talked about that, verse one through 12. Then we talked about how to live out those Beatitudes, verse uh, uh, 13 through 16, then seven, uh, then 17 through 20, we looked at how Jesus viewed the Old Testament, and then Jesus, for the rest of chapter 5, gives us six examples of how to surpass the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. We've already went over two of those examples. In the first example, we went over uh, what was worse than murder, and we found out that hate was worse than murder. The second example Jesus used how you can surpass the righteousness of Pharisees is adultery. And we found out that was worse than adultery. We found out that lust was worse than adultery because in both of those incidents, it starts in the heart. This is Jesus' third example. This is his third example of how our righteousness can surpass the righteousness of the Pharisees and Sadducees. And he deals with the subject of divorce. Well, how is that? Watch what he says in verse 31. And then we're going to give you some statistics. Verse 31. Furthermore, it has been said, whoever divorces his wife, let him give her a certificate of divorce. Stop right there. Number one, this is the Pharisees and Sadducees' view of divorce. That is not God's view of divorce. I'll explain that later on. And in verse 32, but I say to you, that's why Jesus said, but I say to you. In other words, what Jesus is about to do, let me give you the real meaning of divorce. Not verse 31. That's not the real meaning of divorce. That was the Pharisees and Sadducees. But let me give you the real meaning that Moses and God was trying to reiterate with divorce. And verse 32 says, But I say to you that whoever divorces his wife for any reason except sexual immorality causes her to commit adultery. And whoever marries a woman who is divorced commits adultery. So why did we get married in the first place if we're going to get divorced? Let me give you some statistics. Uh, in our society today, there is an attack on the family. Uh, uh, the world doesn't want the family system. When we say the family system, we talk about a husband, wife, and children. The world wants to destroy that. Now, there was a, a woman in, from the Women's Lib who wrote a book about uh, the family. She said, we need to get rid of the family because what the family unit does, it causes women to stay in bondage. So we got to get rid of the family. But there was another person back in 1979. Listen to this. And this most of this, what I tell you that he said in 1979 is going to sound prophetic to you. Just remember, this was written in 1979 by Dr. Arnon Nikolai, who was a psychologist. And he did an extensive uh, research on the family. And he said this and back in 1979. He stated that if we don't change the trends that were happening in 1979, certain things were going to happen to the family in the next generation. So I want you to understand when they say generation, they're talking about 25 to 30 years of uh, generation. So he said this, that he stated that the most common thing that affects a family is the loss of one parent or two parents through death or divorce. When parents do not interact with their children physically and emotionally, it will affect the child in a great way. The child will grow up and become an emotional wreck. We're going to explain that. What has happened in the, to the development of the child is this. What will help a child develop is a warm, positive relationship with both parents. 
But there are certain trends, this is 1979, that make this difficult. Now, he gave six trends. And I'm going to start with uh, six being the least worst and all the way up to number one, which would be the worst thing that could ever happen to a family. So let's look at number six. He said, and you probably laugh at this one, 1979, married women with children working outside the home when there is no help to raise children in the home. In other words, the job becomes more important than the children. He said that was number six in 1979, that uh, two families or two people working in the family, the husband and the wife, and something is going to lack in the family, he's saying, if uh, they both are working hard and they both want their jobs to be successful. So, well, actually, I thought about that because me and my wife work. So, you have to think about this. When you come home from your job, then either somebody got to cook, somebody has to clean, somebody got to help the kids with the homework, somebody got to keep the house up, but if, if, if both people are working, nine times out of ten, guess who that word falls on? Oh yeah, that's right, the wife. She comes home and cook, she comes home and clean, she comes home and does what? She helps the kids, she do all this. So watch this. If, if that's the case, then there is something that's wrong with the family unit. So something is going to go lacking somewhere. And nine times out of ten, it's going to be the kids. It's going to be the children. Because once that, that system goes on for a while, guess what the parents are going to say when they start coming home? I'm tired. Go sit down. Go watch TV. I'm t don't, don't stay around me. I'm tired. Go watch TV. Well, I'm hungry. Go make you a peanut butter jelly sandwich. I, look, I ain't cooking. I ain't doing anything. I'm tired. So that's what happens to the family. That was number six. Now, the fifth thing is this. Families moving frequently from house to to house. He says this is going to be detrimental to the family. Why? Because you know that when you move so much and, and statistically it was proven that when you move so much children do not understand stability. In other words, they, they're, they're not stable. They can't be committed to anything because they don't see it happening in their life. And it was this was, this was amazing. This is 1979. He said in 1979 over 50% of Americans moved every five years. Now, think about my children, the house I live in now, we've been living there since 1993, 94, it was 95. <laughs> we bought the house in 90, 95, around 95. So the house we live in, Josh, that's the only house he's ever lived in. That's the second house Jasmine lived in. Then I thought about, uh, I work in the school system, and I talk to kids about where they live. I guarantee, I tell you, I, I'm not lying to you, I tell you, when these kids tell me, 18, 19, they lived in about five to six different houses, and half of them don't even know where they're going to sleep tonight. And they're 18 to 19 years old. So this statistics is true, that they don't either live with an auntie, or they're living with an uncle, or they're living with a friend down the street, and some of them living with from, from house to house. They don't even know where they're going to sleep. So when they don't have that kind of stability, what that means is they don't even trust anybody. The kids don't even have any sense of, of connection with anybody because if I stay here too long, then guess what? Either they don't kick me out or I got to move somewhere else. So once again, it destroys the family because there is co no connection. When children are raised in an environment like this, they become unstable adults. This is what you have to look at. That was number five. Number four uh, thing, the invasion of the television. It's going to destroy the family. Remember, this is back in 1979. Now, in 1979, all the way up to now, you can think about it. That's almost 30 years. What shows have come, came and gone on television from 1979 till now that changed America? And I just want you to know, where every time you watch TV, whatever program you're watching, the person who produced that program, they want to send a message yes. to you. Whatever that message is, whatever that pro that program is, they want to either, we call sitcoms, uh, uh, situation comedies, we like to call them situation comedies, they want to laugh into your house a situation. They want to laugh into your house an uh, idea. Let's see, uh, the normal family. What idea do we want to uh, uh, laugh into your situation? They want to laugh into your, your house and your home that homosexuality is okay. Then, I know that's the normal, that's the, what's called that? 
the modern family. The other is called the new normal. Yeah. That's the other new show. The new normal. Same situation. Now, so you got to be careful how you raise your kids because if you're going to throw them in front of the TV, this is what they're watching. Right. If they're watching any type of soap opera, if they're watching any type of show, every show is trying to send out a message. It has been statistically stated that if you live to be 80 years old, you, you would have watched over 4,000 days in your lifetime of television. That's enough time to change your mind. That's enough time to, to change your idea about life. So when you watch TV, you should be sitting right there with your children. And if you see something that's not the same idea that you are trying to teach your children, you need to correct them right then and right there. Now, you see that situation? That really wasn't funny. They're trying to put homosexuality in the family, but you know what the Bible says about it. See, you got to do that. When you take your kids to the movies, I don't care what movie you're taking them to. And I, it hurts my heart when I see, I go to a rated R movie and I see a five-year-old there. And I see a seven-year-old there. And then, well, as long as they are uh, with a guardian or a parent, that doesn't make any sense to me. Because they're going to see something, they're going to hear something to me that they are not mature enough to see it. So that's why they put a rating on there in the first place. 13, PG-13, PG, rated R. Why would you, adult, take a 10-year-old to a rated R movie knowing good and well they can see and hear about anything? Their minds are not ready to receive the information that you're trying to get to them. So once again, they're trying to process something that you push in their minds early in their life instead of waiting till they are mature enough to understand. Either you teach them what these things mean or the world is going to teach them and they're not going to be nice about it. That was number four. Watch number three. Lack of self, he said this in 1979, lack of self-control in our society is going to bring down the family. How is that? How can lack of self-control? Well, we live in a society that there are no standards anymore. No more standards. What does that equal to? No standards equal to deep moral confusion. Deep moral confusion equals to great guilt, and great guilt equals to bad behavior. The reason we're seeing the way our young people are acting today is because we haven't taught them self-control. And remember, my wife was just talking about this earlier. In the, I grew up in the 70s and 80s. So uh, if when I, and Sister Jackson is here too, she knows how our parents were when we were growing up. If we did something in our house, I mean, there was no even no talking. I just got hit in the mouth just right there, right there and there. I mean, we found ourselves getting up off the floor. That's how it was. So my mom, when she whipped us, oh, you want to do something? She would just pull a stick out of the plant. She would, oh, you want? She'd go in and pull a whole branch out. What you say? Or she'd throw a shoe. Would, I mean, that's that's the way it was in the seventies and eighties. But now we let our kids do any and everything, say anything they want to say, do it. I'm talking about at two years old, at three years old. We do not correct them. So when you don't correct your kids, when they this little, when they get this big, guess what's going to happen? They're going to start correcting you. And they're going to start hitting you. And they're going to start cussing you out. And then you're going to say, well, what did I do wrong? Well, the first thing you did wrong, you didn't take care of them when they was down here. You see, you put the fear of God down here. When they get older, okay, gee, my mama, she ain't going to play. My mama's 5'2". I'm still scared of my mama. My mama said, boy, she told my brothers, you know what? If you do anything, well, I, I don't care how tall you get, I'll step in a chair and knock you down. That's what I do. I don't care. That's what she was saying. That's how our parents were. But now, parents are afraid of their children instead of teaching their children the way of God. So we see this bad behavior. And watch this. Not only does this going to uh, lack self-control, he said this in 1979, then crime is going to rise. Have we seen a rise in crime from 1979 to now? Uh, he said this in 79, homosexuality will be the new normal. Mass murder will be on the rise. Let's just talk about 2012 alone, the theater and, and uh, the Batman show. People get killed. Now you had the little kids being killed. Then you can talk about Virginia Tech. We can go on. People were shot in the mall just a couple of weeks ago. It's 
it's getting worse and worse and that's because people are out of control and these people used to be children yes. Yes. see that, that's what I want you to understand they was in somebody's family yes. that's somebody's daughter yes. that's somebody's yes. son yes. that's doing these things yes. and my question is what happened to that little kid that ended up growing up trying to kill 30 or 40 people uh, just a case for the young man that killed, he was 20 years old, killed the young cute children. Did you know that he had mental issues? We already understand that. But my question was, if my son has mental issues, why am I going to teach him how to fire a gun? And not only that, I showed him where the guns were and I didn't lock them up. So number one, once again, bad parenting. If I know my son crazy, little boy, take this pill, go sit down somewhere. Ain't Look, you ain't touching nothing. I'm like, I got it in a safe with three different combinations on it. That's the way you, if that's how your child is, you should know your child. You should know the behavior of your child. And you know what your child is capable of. And if you're not getting that child any help, then shame on you. Because that boy needed some help. And guarantee you, nobody looked at him and just overlooked everything that he was doing. So mass murder is on the rise. Number, number two. Lack of communication in the home. Now, this is this is uh, 1979. He said in 1979, the average father spent 38 seconds a day with his son. So that was 30 years ago. Now we see fathers don't spend no time with their sons today. So we see lack of communication in the home. That was number two. But the number one thing that destroys the family. And it's not lack of self-control. It's not lack of communication. It is, watch this, divorce. Divorce is the number one thing. The separation of the husband and the wife. The separation of mama and daddy is the number one thing that destroys a kid's life. As a matter of fact, the, the rate back then, in 1979, was one out of every 1.8 marriage ending divorce. That's half. Today, just to let you know statistically, that divorce has gone down just a little bit. Now, the reason divorce is going down a little bit in the statistics show is because nobody getting married anymore. Everybody's shacking. So everybody that's already married, already married. So the reason we don't see any rates of divorce rates going down or marriage going up because nobody wants to get married anymore. People are living together, cohabitating together, and don't want to get married. That's why we don't see it. But the ones who are married, the statistics are still the same. One out of every two marriages in the first seven years are going to end in divorce. As a matter of fact, you can see, watch the celebrities on television now. Well, somebody yeah. spent a five, five hundred thousand or two million dollars on a wedding, they divorce in 30 days. That means they don't take marriage seriously enough. So divorce is number one. Then he said this. This is really amazing. He says, if these trends, those six trends, continue from 1979 to now, we're going to have a society that's going to need more health mental health care than ever before. And don't you see it today? Even in elementary schools and, and middle schools, the first thing they want to do to your kid is do what? They want to put him on some type of medication. They want to say something's wrong with him, but it, was, it wasn't so when I was coming up. They had Ritalin when I was in elementary school. They had that kind of stuff. But nine times out of ten, the parents would say, no, nah, I'll take care of Johnny myself. So when we get home, Johnny's going to be all right. He's going to sit down tomorrow. Because he won't be able to sit down when he get home. See, that, that's how we took care of our kids then. We ain't put you on no pills. We ain't doing nothing. I got something that's going to straighten you out, little Johnny. So that's what happens. Then guess what? We stop doing that. We stop disciplining our kids. The Bible says spoil the rocks. What, spare, spare the child, spoil the rock. We're, we're, that's what we're doing. The Bible says beat them. They won't die. That's what it says. It says that. Whoop your children. It will not kill them. The way, the problem is this. Some people whoop their children out of anger. You don't supposed to whoop out of anger. Calm down. I know you messed up. I know you wrote all on your walls and everything. So calm down for a minute and say, now you know I'm going to get you in a minute. My mama used to wake us up. I told y'all I was going to get you. 
I told you, you thought I forgot all about that girl. I told you I was going to get you. And then I guarantee, and guess what? We never, ever forgot about it. So once again, we know that it's because of these different trends that we're seeing. It's going to destroy the family. Guess what's going to be on the rise? Suicide is going to be on the rise. And we see that. Murder is on the rise. So the question is this. What can we do about it? Well, the world says the reason we need to change uh, or get rid of divorce is because look at what it's doing. We look at what it's doing to society. But that's not our reason. The reason we say we need to get rid of divorce is because God's word says we need to do something about it. And that is line up with God's word. Don't say something is wrong because it affects society or affects this or that. It's wrong because God says it's wrong. Because what's going to happen when society says it's right? Are you going to say it's right when society says it's right? No. It's still wrong because God's word says it's wrong. Did you know most churches have a wrong view of marriage and they give wrong advice about marriage. So let me tell you how Christian life, uh, so you can remember this, this is, this is our view on marriage. I'm not going to marry anybody that's not born again. So I'm not going to marry a, a born again man to an unsaved woman. And I'm not going to marry a saved woman to an unsaved man. When I do a marriage, I want both of them to be born again believers. Unless they, well, well, we don't want you to do our marriage. We just want to use your facility. You can't do that either. If you want to get married in this building, and it's going to be me or nobody else, and you can't bring sister so-and-so and brother so-and-so to marry your two cousins, who both one saved and one ain't, one, one a Muslim and one a Christian, and then you want them to get married inside of a Christian church. No, it's not going to happen. We're only going to marry those who are born again believers. That, that's how uh, that's our stance on marriage in this building. Now watch this. The Bible says in Malachi, we're going to look at it a little later, God hates divorce. That's what it says, and we're going to look at that. There are four views on marriage and divorce, and I'm going to give them to you, and then we're going to talk about them throughout the series. Here are the four views on marriage. Here's the first view. No divorce for any reason nor under any circumstance. There are some churches that teach that. No divorce for any reason under any circumstance. Here's uh, view number two. Yes, divorce, but under certain circumstances, but no remarriage. Here they go. Yes, divorce, but under certain circumstances, but no remarriage. View number three. Yes, divorce and remarriage for any reason under any circumstance. I just want to let you know that's the Pharisees' view. That was their view. Their view, yes, divorce and remarriage for any reason under any circumstance. And the last view is yes, divorce and remarriage, but under certain circumstances. And that's Jesus' view. Yes, divorce and remarriage under certain circumstances. Jesus said what his circumstance was. Now, in order for us to do that, that's throughout the series. We might not get to all that today. So today we just might get to the foundation of marriage. I want you to understand what marriage is. So let's go to Genesis. Genesis 2, 21 through 24. You can read along with me if you want to, but I'm going to read. This is where marriage comes from. This is how marriage started, and this is the way God wants marriage to be. And I'll be reading from, uh, I think the King James Version, and it says in Genesis 2.23, I mean 2.21, And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from man made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bones and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother. His marriage right here, God did this. Therefore shall a man leave his father and his mother and shall cleave unto his wife and they shall be what? One flesh. 
What is God's view on marriage? God's view on marriage is this. God brings a man and woman together in holy matrimony and he wants them to become one flesh. God wants a lifelong monogamous relationship between a man and a woman. Right. Notice that verse in the, the, the verse that said cleave to his wife. The word cleave, the Hebrew word means glue. You are glued together. You are stuck together. Not that you stuck with her like, I'm stuck with this. No, no. Not that kind of stuff. No. Glued together. Together. You are together to, to make one, to, to be together as one. So when he says he you are glued to his wife, a lot of points that the people forget, he says they leave their mother and their father and they become one flesh. So you can't be one living in your mama's basement. You, you can't be, he says, leave your mother and your father and you become one. When you get married, you should have in your idea that I'm leaving my family to start a family. This, this family, yes, we are a long extension of my, my already family, but God want me to leave my mother and father. Why are you still living with your mother and father and got your girlfriend living with you too? No, 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 you got married. You got your wife living with you, and now your mama and your daddy taking care of you and your wife. Uh -uh. He says you got to leave your mother and your father. Now, there may be a situation like the situation me and my wife was in when we were 23 years old and we got married. When we got married, we was 23 years old, and we both had jobs and we lost our job. Now, this time, Sister Eli was uh, several months pregnant, and therefore, we was trying to find a place to stay. So, at that point, we did live with her grandmother for a couple of months, and then we lived with my mom a couple of days. That's the only way we can see you going back and living. See, family should be there to help you out. But you, ain't, you shouldn't be going back. Now, you don't stay here for like 10 more years, you know. When, when, when Kiki get about 10 years old, then we're going we to leave. No, you, Kiki, and your wife got to go. Because it God didn't establish for you to be ra raising your kids in your parents' house. He wants you to get on your own. Now, this is what happened. We both got we got jobs, and then we were able to save up enough money to get our own place. And that's and we never looked back since. But that's the way it's supposed to be. Your family is supposed to help you out when you get into a bad situation. But don't take advantage of your family and say, listen, uh, are we going to stay here five years? What do you mean you're going to stay here five years? What are you doing to get a job? What are you doing to get this, leave your father and your mother and establish your own family? So watch this, divorce. Divorce is, is, is like cutting off your leg because you got a splinter in it. Instead of cutting your leg off, just take the splinter out. Fix the situation. People like to get rid of the marriage. They like to get rid of the marriage instead of fixing the problem. Fix the problem and keep the marriage together. Watch what Jesus says. Jesus says this in Matthew 19 and 6. Wherefore, they are no more twain, but one flesh. What therefore God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. Do you know what that word put asunder means? It's the same Greek word for divorce. What God has put together, let no man divorce. That's what he's saying. Nobody should break up the marriage that God has set. Now listen. All marriages, whether you are saved or unsaved, are ordained by God. You know why? They're ordained by God because God is the one that established the institution of marriage. Whether you are Buddhist, whether you are Muslim, everybody get married, don't they? Where do you think they get that idea from? That idea comes from this Bible, the idea of marriage. But now, as I told you earlier, we see a, a, a system or a train of people living together and not getting married. They are not doing what God wants them to do. So what happens? What happens when a person, and I, I found something else out as I was studying this. You know, we talked about this when we dealt with adultery. That when you were caught in adultery in those days, you know what happened? You were killed. Did you know that if you were caught in fornication, they didn't kill you for fornication? You were only whipped for fornication? That means God has a high view of marriage. Even marriage had a more higher view than fornication. And that's found in Leviticus 19 and 20. Now let's see what Jesus also said about marriage. He said this in Matthew 19, 
Verse 7 and 8, write it down. They say unto you, why did Moses then command to give a writing of divorcement and to put her away? And he said it to them. Jesus said, Moses, because of the hardness of your hearts, suffered you to put away your wives, but from the beginning it was not so. Now, go back again to verse 7. They said, then why did Moses command that we get a letter of divorcement? Stop right there. Moses never commanded that they get a divorce. Jesus gave the real answer. No, Moses didn't command. He permitted you because of the hardness of your heart to get a divorce and you should only get a divorce for one reason and that is unfaithfulness. That's if you choose to because there's many marriages that even make it through that. So it's your choice, married people. If you, if it happens to you that your spouse has been unfaithful to you, it's still your choice whether or not you reconcile with that spouse or you get a divorce. But he said the only way, the only reason Moses permitted it is because of your hardness of your heart. But Moses never commanded that you can get a divorce for any reason. So the Eli said, I'm going to divorce whoever Eli because he don't take out the garbage. <laughs> I would divorce Sister Eli because she don't cook like Mama cook. I'll tell you, people get divorced over silly reasons. There is a law that, uh, that you don't have to uh, uh, write down or tell anyone why you, what, what is it called? No, no fault or something, uh, marriage, divorce or something. You get divorced for any reason. Any reason you can get divorced, but that's not so with the Bible. There's only one reason for divorce, and that is unfaithfulness. Now, there may be one other way you can get out of a marriage if, and this is found in the New Testament, I'm going to go into great detail in part two, but I'm going to tell you what it is now. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians that if you are a saved person and your spouse is an unsaved person and they walk away from you and they divorce you, you are free from that marriage. But you are not are able to walk away from that unsaved person. How do you sound? You get saved and then your husband still not saved. Well, baby, I'm leaving you now because I'm saved now. I got the Lord on my side and you, you fool of the devil so I'm going to go ahead and divorce you. <laughs> That's what people say. They do it all the time. He didn't say do that. No, no, no. You were supposed to stay saved, stay married to your unsaved spouse. Why? Because the Bible says even you can influence him to come to Jesus Christ. The way he sees the change in your life, he may turn and come to Christ. And he may not. But let him leave, but not you leave. Here's a, the, the main passage too. Let's go to Malachi. And you can write it down. Malachi 2.13-16. through When I saw this passage about marriage and divorce, it was amazing. It says this. And this is the second thing you do. You cover the altar of the Lord with tears, with weeping and crying. So he does not regard the offering anymore, nor receive it with goodwill from your hands. Yet you say, for what reason? Because the Lord has been witness between you and the wife of your youth with whom you have dealt treacherously. Yet she is your companion and your wife by covenant. But did he not make them one, having a remnant of the spirit? And why one? He seeks godly offspring. Therefore, take heed to your spirit and let none deal treacherously with the wife of his youth. Verse 16, for the Lord God of Israel says that he hates divorce. For it covers one's garment with violence, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, take heed to your spirit that you do not deal treacherously. What's going on? In verse 13, God doesn't care about the man's worship because of verse 15, he divorced his wife to marry somebody else. That's why. He didn't divorce her because she cheated on him. He divorced her so he can be with somebody else. So therefore, he tries to worship God. God said, I don't want your worship because you have done your wife wrong. You have treated her wrongly. He says that is the wrong thing to do. And then he ends up in verse 16. God hates divorce. Now, if God hates divorce, guess what you got to do? You got to hate divorce too. And, and you might say, well, what does all that mean? It means this. Divorce comes from sin. Where does sin come from? Sin comes from the fall. So, in order for us to see where divorce really comes from, let's go back to the fall. In Genesis 
Now you gotta look at this one. I want you to turn to this one. This is the one of the last two verses we have. Verse 16. It says this. Unto the woman. Now, after they fell, God passed down some curses. Now, this is the curse he gave to the woman. I want you to see this is a curse. It's not a blessing, it is a curse. Listen what the curse he gave to the woman in verse three, chapter 3, verse 16 of Genesis. Unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception. In sorrow thou shalt bring forth children. So, guess what? She's going to have pain in her childbearing. Then he says this. Explain this to me. And they desire, and, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. My question to you is, that is a curse. That's not a blessing. He says, and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. Now look, you have two sinners that are living in the same house because they both fail. How do you think that marriage is going to operate if they are not willing to work together? What does it mean when he says, your desire shall be to your husband, but he shall rule over thee? That word desire means this. It means that God has allowed in this curse for a woman, watch this, to have a desire to rule her husband, but he says, but he shall rule over thee. Marriage was a wonderful thing that God started way back in Genesis 1. Now watch this. Here's the blessing. Here's the real way of marriage. Genesis 1, 27, 28. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. And God blessed them. And God said unto them, Be fruitful and multiply and do what? Replenish the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the earth. Now listen, before the fall, guess how Adam and Eve worked together? They worked together. They were submissive to one another. And that's why Jesus said, Husbands, love your wives as Christ even loved the church. So back in Genesis 1, the husband and wife was a team. There, there was nobody fighting. There was no bickering. There was no fighting. The woman wasn't trying to rule the man. The man wasn't trying to rule the woman. They worked together. That's how a Christian relationship is supposed to work. You're not going to see that in an unsaved relationship, but in a Christian family, you husband and wives need to see yourselves as a team and your children, you need to look at, that's what we're working on. As a team together, we're going to work to to raise these children uh, uh, the way God wants us to raise them. You know, children will love to pick sides with the parents. You, you know that. When my kids are little, they ask me one thing, and I say no. So they go right to mama. Hey, mama, can I have this? And then, see, we knew that earlier, so we told them, we told them, uh, my wife, I said, now, when they come to ask you, just say, well, what did your daddy say? And if they come to ask me, then I say, well, what did your mama say? So they wouldn't, they didn't even know. Well, she said no. Then it's no. But see, you have conflict in the family because when the father says yes, the mama said no, and then that's not, now you got conflict between mom and daddy because he don't go, they're not telling him no, so you always trying to overrule me. You trying to just despise my authority. I'm the head of this house. You don't tell my, you know, that's how I go. That's how I go in the family, and it's vice versa. Whoever says what well first, that's who goes, but it shouldn't be that way. It should be working together. So me and my wife, and we understood this, and I think this is the success of our marriage. We learned at an earlier age, in an earlier stage in our marriage, to compromise with one another. We learned that in order for our marriage to work, nobody is right, nobody is wrong. We need to work this thing out together. So, so in, in other words, we learned this at an early age. If my wife got home late and, and I got home early, then how come I couldn't fix the chicken? And make the rice. 
And then vice versa. If she got home uh, early and I got home late, see, we work together. Well, it's your turn to put the kids to bed. I put the kids to bed last night. See, we work together. When you work together, that's how the children, see, your kids are looking at you. And if you're fighting all the time, that's what you're raising your children into, and they're going to become emotional wrecks. But watch what he says in verse 316. He says, uh, the word room means set over. In verse 28, it was a different rule. It means that they work together. So watch this in Genesis 4 and 7. It talks about Cain. It says this, if thou doest well, shalt thou not be accepted? And if thou doest not well, sin lieth at the door, and unto thee shall be his desire, and thou shalt rule over him. He said the same thing to Cain that he said to Eve. You're going to have a sin wants to rule over you, Cain, but you got to subdue it. You got to sub you got to be the power over it. Eve, there's going to be a desire in you because I'm putting this desire in both y'all and y'all. I'm going to put a conflict. You're going to have a desire to rule your husband, but now he's going to rule over you. It wasn't like that in the beginning of marriage. So how, how should it work? So what, what happened? This is what happened. In the fall, you got to understand this is why we don't believe in women pastors. Here it is. So the sin of Eve was this. She took over the leadership role in the fall. Right? When the snake said, eat of this fruit, what was she supposed to do? She was supposed to say, no, my, she was to call her husband or, re, or recite to the snake what the husband said, God said to him. And which was, no, I said, I can't eat this because my husband told me that God said that the day we eat of this, we shall surely die. No, she didn't do that. She usurped her authority. She went over his head and did what? As the Bible says, he was standing right there with her. She said, all right, yeah, we gonna, this look good for food here, Adam. He's standing right there. And so his sin was, he, watch this, she took over his authority, and guess what he did? He walked away and abandoned his leadership. He submitted unto her. And God said, oh, y'all want it like that? That's how y'all want it? Then you're going to have it like that from now on. Your woman, you're going to have a desire to your husband to rule over him, but he going to rule over you, and y'all going to have this bickering and fighting. That's a curse. That's not the way it's supposed to be. The way it's supposed to be is that two born-again believers are supposed to be able to go to the Lord with their problems and work that situation out. You're supposed to be able to pray together. You're supposed to be able to read the scriptures together. That's the way marriage is supposed to be. So don't let nobody tell you that you got to bicker and fight throughout your marriage life. No, you don't. You can say, listen, Lord, I want you to thank, thank you for giving me a saved man. And we're going to pray together about this situation. We're going to work together for our children. We all work together in our finances. We are going to do this thing together because we are together as one couple. God made you one flesh. So that's the foundation of marriage. Then as I conclude, I'd like to let you know that the foundation of marriage is this. The best person that you know that is the best type of, of, of husband is Jesus Christ himself. The Bible says that Jesus is our husband. We, he is our bridegroom. We are the bride of Christ. And don't you know if we're the bride of Christ. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. That means I'll never divorce you. I'll never get rid of you. If Jesus can handle us in our sins, if Jesus can handle us in our mess, and he's our husband, what do you think a real marriage should be able to do? You should be able to work out all your problems. You should be able to work out all your situation. If Jesus can forgive you of your sins, you can forgive your wife or, their, or your husband for their sins. You can begin to raise your children because God wants you to do this. Don't let those trends get involved in your family. Jesus is the head. He is the bridegroom. The Bible says he's coming back again one day and when he comes back again one day he's going to present the bride of Christ before the Father. He says without spot or wrinkle. Jesus is glad that he's your husband. He's glad that he's the groom and that you're the bride. Husbands, you've got to be glad that God gave you a wife. You better be glad that God gave you a helper. You better be glad that God gave you somebody that loves you for you. You better be glad that God gave you
give you somebody that's gonna take care of your big head kids. You better be glad that somebody will love you enough uh, to have some children by you, to love you enough uh, to clean your children, to love you enough uh, to clean your house, to love you enough uh, to fix you something to eat. You gotta say thank God for the spots that I have. Why did I get married? I got married because God says it's good for a man not to be alone and that he needs to find him a wife. And when he finds a wife, he's gonna find a good thing. I don't know about you, but I, the reason I got married is because God says if you find a godly woman, she'll be able to take care of you. I don't know about you. Me and my wife, we pray together. Yeah, we sing together. But most of all, we work together. We ain't been married 23 years for, for nothing. We've been married this long because God allowed us to work out our problems. We got problems like everybody else, but we go to God in prayer. That's why we got married. Yeah, we have arguments just like everybody else, but we don't go to bed at night without saying, baby, I'm sorry. I, I know I've done wrong. I know I messed up this time. You know, it's mostly the husband that gonna say, I've done wrong. I messed up this time. So guess what? I ain't, I ain't proud, too proud to say, I'm sorry. I ain't too proud to say, I messed up. Why did I get married? Because God's word says, you need to find a wife or a spouse and you will work it out together. Come on, put your hands together. Let's give the Lord a hand clap of praise. He's good and very good. Amen, amen. Every head bowed and every eye closed. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for allowing us to understand your word today. Lord, we thank you just for the foundation of marriage that you have given us. The foundation of why we should get married and why we should stick together and fight the good fight of faith if we're born again believers. There might be somebody here who don't know Jesus Christ as the Savior and, and now they understand that he is the greatest groom, the greatest husband that the world could ever have. He's our spiritual husband that died on the cross and he made a place for us and he says if he prepare a place for us he's coming back to receive us and take us to that place. If you're here today and you want Christ to be the head of your life, you want him to be the Lord of your life where every head is bowed and every eye is closed, just raise your hand right where you stand or where you sit. If you don't know Jesus as your savior you can make him the head of your life today. If you're here today and, and, and you already know Jesus as your savior, you just backslid from him. You have you want to rededicate your life to him. You already made him the Lord of your life. If you're here today, we want to pray with you. If you're here while every head is bowed and eye closed, raise your hand. Why where you said I see you, brother. We want to we see you there. If you want to rededicate your life, we're going to pray with you that God restore you back to the fellowship that you have with him. And last but not least, if you're here today and you're looking for a church home, we if you want Christian life church to be your church hall. We're a church that's going to teach you the word verse by verse. We're going to go through the Bible. It's going to hurt us sometimes. We're going to say ouch. We're going to say, oh Lord, help me. But we're going to keep on going and thanking God for everything that he's done for us. If you're here today and you want Christian life to be that church family that you need in these days, raise your hand right where you sit and we will pray with you as well. Amen. Come on, put your hands together and give the Lord a hand. Have a praise. Those who raise your hand, please come on down first. Come on down, those who raise your hand, we're going to pray with you.